Well, everyone, I'm so pleased to have Lindsay Keys with me today. And we're going to be talking about a really serious topic that just does not get enough attention. It's something that's really close to my heart. We're going to be talking about Lyme disease, what it is, how it's so underfunded, under-researched, badly handled by the medical system. And it's very close to my heart because when I was only eight years old, I had tick bite fever. They called it tick bite fever then. And I was sick for weeks and months. And my one of my children has been battling with it for years, one of my nephews. And just to try and get treatment and the thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars, Lindsay, that we've had to spend outside of the insurance system to just get it identified and treated is crazy. So welcome, Lindsay. I'm very, very excited to talk to you and hear your story and talk about the mental health aspects of Lyme disease because they are plenty serious ones, including things like suicidal thoughts and so on. So welcome today to share your wonderful expertise that you have and personal experience. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. And yeah, it's a challenging topic, but I think talking about it is very important. And it's good to know that this this disease can be avoided. And if you're going through it, there is hope as well. And so I'm excited to share all of it. I'm a totally open book. That's wonderful. And I'm so glad we're going to share the hope because it's one of those things that I know when I was sick with it, that they just, it was antibiotic after antibiotic after, and I just got sicker with everything and eventually landed up being in bed for like three months as an eight year old, which was terrible, even getting rheumatic fever and that kind of thing. And it was just terrible. So there's so many, so many, there is hope. There is, and and that's what we can talk about as well. Okay. So Lindsay, let's tell your story. You've just, you, you were living in, you actually moved to Joshua Tree to get away from the land of ticks, although ticks are everywhere. And now you're back in, in New York state and back in the land of ticks, as you were saying to me before. I found that funny. I've never heard the New York state being described as the land of ticks. So tell us, you know, where did this whole thing start? Cause I, I, I know a little, I mean, I know your story, but just to orientate my readers, you're going to get the uh, listeners, I should say, the, you're going to get the full story, but cause you, you first discovered you had this unknown illness when you were a student and it took years and then you ended up making an amazing documentary, which we're going to talk about. And so tell us your story and how you got to the documentary and then we can unpack all the details that we need to help people. Yeah. So the story is long and winding. And it was actually while making The Quiet Epidemic that I started to piece together this mystery that was my entire life up until that point. Mm. So my co-director and I, we would be out with our cameras filming doctors and at you know conferences and whatnot, learning about the illness. We were going on this investigation and I was just having so many aha moments and it was very challenging to realize that I had actually, I think, first become infected as early as third grade. Wow. So I was diagnosed with mono in third grade because Mm -hmm. the doctors didn't know what else to call it. Gosh. And I remember them being baffled and I remember thinking, how strange and scary that was to be a child and to be so sick and to have all the doctors just kind of shrugging their shoulders and not knowing what to call mm. it. So they just kind of, it's almost like they just drew a, some, a name out of a bag or something. <laughs> like, oh, okay, it's mono because Gosh. you have some mono symptoms, but I was very high functioning. I was an athlete. I was a top student. I remember feeling tired a lot. But mm. I just thought, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I guess I'm tired a lot. You just explain things away, especially when you're a child and that's your, mm-hmm. that's your normal and you don't really remember what it's like, or maybe you never knew what it was like mm. to be healthy. And I actually had a bullseye rash in high school. Oh. And that was the first time I heard Lyme disease. I was walking mm. around with this bullseye rash on my collarbone for a long time. And no one even mentioned it. It was somebody at a barbecue who said, that looks like Lyme disease. And, oh my gosh. And and this was in rural upstate New York, okay? This is in the heart of the epidemic. And even wow. still, no one was talking about it. I'd mm-hmm. never heard of ticks. I had never been told to check for ticks. There was no mentioning of it at school or, you know, I was out playing in the fields for sports. Nobody ever mm-hmm. talked about ticks, but I was actually treated then. Because I had the bullseye rash and you're lucky if you have the rash. Yeah, because it doesn't always show up. It doesn't. So the very one of the very first studies on Lyme disease on the people who were first diagnosed with quote unquote Lyme disease and Lyme disease Connecticut or in Lyme Connecticut, only a quarter of them had the bullseye rash. And it's just Mm. amazing that that's become the sign 
Gosh. Because in the earliest cohort of, of patients, it wasn't even the majority of them who gosh who displayed had the that rash. rash. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was lucky to have had that rash. I got treated. And again, I was relatively okay. But then I started to feel kind of achy in my arms. And I used to joke that I could tell when a storm was coming because my arms would be throbbing. And I remember sitting oh. in math class as a high school student and feeling my arms aching. And I thought, huh, weird. I don't know. You know, you just, you just don't know. And, and you just, Mm -hmm. again, it becomes your normal. College is when everything changed. The stress of being a college student, I was going through a lot at the time, a lot of emotional stress. And I think that's definitely Mm -hmm. an important point. Activate huge. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think all of the infections that my body had been handling and keeping at bay, with the onset of a pretty severe emotional stressor, everything just started to, to spiral. I had so many bizarre symptoms, chronic throat infections. They just kept coming back. Fevers. I remember just shivering in my, in my college dorm room and, and I could barely take care of myself. And I had intestinal issues. I had a full body rash that broke out and I had all of these symptoms and no one knew what to call it. And mental health symptoms as well? Mine? Not at that point. Not at that point. Yeah. So it was mostly just physical, physical. which was awful enough. Oh, gosh. But yeah. basically, they just, the doctors, I was in various ER rooms over the mm, course of shame. that semester. And I had some surgeries done. They were like, well, let's just cut out the things that are bothering you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> no one was talking about the root what did cause. They, what did they do? What surgeries were they doing? I had a tonsillectomy. So they okay. removed my tonsils okay. and okay. my adenoids. And then I had broken my nose a few times growing up and they thought, well, maybe it's because your nose is broken. So they, you know, gave me a, I think it was called a septoplasty where they carved out my nasal passages. It was all of these like really gnarly Mm. surgeries and I was so young. And again, there was no, there was no consideration of Lyme disease in the picture, despite me going to college in Connecticut. I was a photography major. I was constantly in the woods. I was photographing my friends and, you know, in the grass and in the woods. And I actually photographed my boyfriend at the time in Lyme, Connecticut. And we were in these fields. And I thought, where is everybody? These fields are so beautiful. (laughs) And now you know why no one's there. Oh, yeah. I picked a tick off of his bat that night. And it was my first time ever seeing one. And I flicked it into my garbage can. Because oh I had gosh. no idea. What I had it was. no idea. Yeah. And so again, then there were years of better health. And I was I certainly reinfected while living on Martha's Vineyard after college. Mm-hmm. And that's when it was like, okay, Lyme started to come up in the conversation. And my mom was spiraling with Lyme disease at the time. Oh, gosh. She wow. was the one who really helped me figure things out. Mm. She was saying, Lindsay it sounds like you have Lyme disease. I had tingling, numbness. I couldn't turn my head. I was bedridden. I was so sick. And Lyme disease is rampant on Martha's Vineyard. Wow. And I did not know that before living there. And eventually I was treated with a short course of antibiotics and I recovered for about a year. Mm -hmm. And then that's when everything really fell apart. So you see, it's almost like this, I was on this roller coaster ride Mm -hmm. my whole life. And it was like, I was sick and then I was well and I was sick and well. And, but each time I got sick, I was, it was worse. Okay. More worse symptoms, and worse. More. And then in 2015, that's when I basically over the course of a week developed what people would call schizophrenia, early onset mm-hmm. dementia, multiple Jeez. sclerosis. That's- and I don't know, maybe throw in like, you know, arthritis. Bipolar or something as well. Bipolar. Yeah. I mean, all you of it. You had everything. Oh gosh, everything. that's terrible. And it was terrifying because oh. I knew that I could not go to just any doctor Mm-mm. because I knew that there would not be an exploration of the root cause of my symptoms and that I would just be locked away in a psych ward. And, medi- I knew and it. medicated, medicated yes. to, till the, to the, till the cars came home. Yeah. Exactly. And I would never get out. And so yeah. that's when, you know, my mom at that point, she'd been so frustrated with me telling me, you're not cured. You're not cured of Lyme. Yeah. Like, this is what happens. And there's a controversy. And she's telling me all of this stuff. And I was, I was, it was so hard for me to believe. I didn't want to believe it. But then suddenly my life depended on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
And I resisted going to the doctor despite feeling like my brain had been hijacked by an actual demon. Oh, I was shame. I was actually Googling one point. I was I was Googling demonic possession. <laughs> oh shame. Because I I I didn't that's literally what it felt like. Felt like, yeah. I felt like something had taken over my brain shame. and I was completely aware of it and I had no control over it and I wanted it out. I wanted to be myself. I wanted mm-hmm. to live. And this compulsion took over me that was just it was compelling me all day, every day. This lasted for six months. Okay. Oh, all wow. day, every, every day, day, for six months, every second, it was compelling me to kill myself. Shame. And I had no reference point for this. I didn't know that anything like this could happen to a person. And it just suddenly happened. It happened in that time. I woke time. up. It was overnight. Wow. It was literally overnight. And it was, and it was, it, the onset was an emotional stressor again. I was really, I was upset about my mom. I was, mm. it, it's so ironic because I was so upset about my mom's situation. Yeah. Her having Lyme, she was on the verge of declaring bankruptcy because oh, Lyme disease is not covered by insurance. Oh, and it's thousands and of dollars. Yeah. It's, she, yeah. I mean, she had maxed out her credit cards to pay for life saving treatment because the insurance companies don't want to pay for it. And I thought my mom's going to die. And I can't save her. And I was crying a lot. And the more I cried, the worse my symptoms got. And I, and I just, it was just like this. And then, yeah, it was literally overnight that all of a sudden it felt like it almost felt like the illness, the disease had been in me and it was like waking up. It was Mm. almost like I could feel it waking up inside my body and for the first time in my brain. And I had never experienced that before. Lindsay, can I stop you for one second, uh, just to, to emphasize what you've just said, because that's one of the things that's a hallmark of Lyme, is it doesn't really ever go away, but it lodges and it hides, and then certain things will activate it and it moves um, through the body. And so, you know, those symptoms that you're experiencing, and also they accumulate, so they it doesn't necessarily have to get into the brain. And I know you know this, I'm just saying this for the listeners, and, and, and please yeah. add to it. But once it gets into, it accumulates, so as it, as it gets more and more active and alive and growing more, and it goes into dormancy. When it comes out of dormancy, it generally has spread, and that, that's so you can those cumulative effects of the of the more the mental health challenges and that you know the suicidal thoughts and that kind of thing. It's different for every person, but that's those are very much part of it. There's so many psychiatric symptoms that are associated with it. So I just wanted to sorry, please carry yeah. on. I just wanted to no, emphasize that's that. such a good point. It's an important point. It, mm-hmm. It's yeah. I mean, it's a stealthy infection. It hides, it can go dormant. And it's not the only disease that can do that. And Lyme mm. disease is very closely related to syphilis, yeah. right? And it's yes. called the, you know, the syphilis was called the great imitator. And after yeah. Lyme disease was first discovered, they started to, scientists were actually referring to it as the new great imitator mm-hmm. because it's so similar. And yet in the decades since it's been uh, first named and discovered, that conversation around Lyme disease just kind of went radio silent. You you don't really hear about it no. from mm-hmm. the public health agencies that an infection can cause mental illness and that it can be treated. Yeah. And that's the that's a really important point for me to make. People are asking me all the time, like, well, how are you now? They're almost afraid to ask. And once I got to a doctor who understood the nature of these infections, and I think it's important to note that it is infections. Lyme disease is one of more than 20 pathogens that have been identified in ticks. And that's Mm -hmm. something that I learned the hard way (laughs) by becoming Mm -hmm. infected with a bunch of them. That's right. And there's different ones in different countries and different states. And there's these different types and some respond to certain things and some don't respond to others. So I just want to emphasize that people, it's it's a tick, but it's these lots of pathogens that the tick actually carries and can put into your body. And not all of them will manifest, but some more clusters of them will manifest. Did I explain that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. I love sorry, how did... I love how educated you are on this. And I'm so sorry that you have had to become educated on this. It's such a yeah. it's such a, a scary world to enter, but mm-hmm. this knowledge is life saving. And so it's so important to know. And 
Absolutely. And it's so much easier to grasp before you're sick, right? I exactly. Mean, if we had known this, you know, years before falling ill, I mean, in your case, you were a child of, and, and mine, me too, right? What can mm-hmm. we do about it? But I think about the kids who are suffering now. And if I were a parent, I would really want to know all of this so that I could look out for the signs and, Absolutely. and the symptoms. Absolutely. Right? You, you're quite right. If I think of it, my sister's a son also. That's actually four people in my, my immediate family that got it when they were quite young. My, my youngest daughter got it when she was much older. But when, if I just think back to the days of, I mean, I really, I'm 60, I was eight. It's a long time ago that they identified that as 52 years ago. But they, I, I got so sick with rheumatic fever and various other sicknesses that they, the way that they collectively treated everything, that seemed to knock it out of my body because I didn't have lingering symptoms after that. I still have the mark where the tick bit me. All these years oh, later, wow. I still have a whole bump where you can actually see the bump from the, from the tick bite fever. But, you know, I, don't, I think it was almost, I was, it was lucky that the, but there were all the other medications I were on from the rheumatic fever, which I think was, all of it was related. I'm pretty certain to tonsillitis. I shed my tonsils mm-hmm. out. They mm-hmm. did all of that. Yep. And it was such an intensive treatment for, for over sort of a three month period that I think I was lucky. Whatever they did managed <laughs> to control it. But I, but my, my family members were not as lucky. It was, took was so much longer. And I know my nephew now is still battling like crazy to manage it. Yeah. And I think that that can be confusing for some people, mm. especially people who are skeptical of the severity of Lyme disease. Why do some people do well with the treatment and it seems to work with that for them and other people don't? And I think it's just, you know, now we're seeing with COVID, for example, and long COVID, mm. infections impact all people differently. There's no, it, it's not, it's not just this narrow manifestation that every person's, you know, genetics and their environmental factors mm-hmm. are going to perfectly <laughs> interplay with. with. It mm-hmm. just doesn't work that way. So I think it's, it, it is important to note that, yeah, for some people, if, especially if you get treated early, the earlier the treatment, the better chance you have of improving. And, and I think, yeah, for, for hopefully, you know, for those who have a stronger immune system in general, then of course they're going to have a better chance of fighting it off. And some of us aren't as lucky. Some of us were born with weakened immune systems. Some of us are exposed to things like toxic mold and other mm-hmm. environmental toxins that can weaken our immune system. And so everybody, everybody, every body <laughs> handles yeah. Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases differently. But I was actually lucky and that I respond, once I got the treatment, I actually responded to it fairly quickly for some of the symptoms, for the scariest ones. The, all of the psychiatric manifestations that I was experiencing within a couple of months of treatment were gone. That's amazing. Wow. And that is so important because I think about <laughs> how many people are out there living with these lifelong, what they believe to be lifelong, lifelong diagnoses, right? Which is wrong anyway, which is it unscientific is. anyway. Of course. So it's right. just shocking. It is shocking, right? And many mm-hmm. of them children. I have mm-hmm. so many, I have friends and I know people who are going through this now who mm-hmm. were in or are in psychiatric wars, just like oh. I would have been had I gone to the wrong doctor. I don't, I wouldn't have made it out. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be alive talking to you right now if I hadn't gotten to the doctors I'd gone to because I didn't think that I could survive one more second. Oh, shame. I'm so sorry. With that feeling that was in my Mm -hmm. brain, I was like, every night I was going to bed like, oh, please, this has to be gone. I have, this has to be gone by tomorrow morning. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do with this. Shame. And then it would be there. But after a few months of treatment, all of those symptoms went away. and, And then it was a matter of peeling back all of these other layers. And, and I did so many treatments and so we could talk about them if you're yeah, I interested. Want to, I want to say that, please, I, I know that I can, I can almost feel my listeners and viewers <laughs> saying, okay, so what are the symptoms and what are the treatments yeah, and what worked yeah. for you and what are the combinations? And totally. so, you know, if you don't mind, let's just transition yeah, yeah. there. We can always we let's can do come it. back. Let's transition to, you know, what are the treatments and what are the tests that people need to go for and, and how does the whole, totally. how does the whole thing work? And Maybe start, let's just do this in a nice organized way. Maybe I know you've spoken a bit about the symptoms, but let, let's talk about the symptoms, physical and mental, just summarize yep. them. And then let's talk about the treatment options. Okay. And then, you know, the time involved in that. Totally. Okay. And so, maybe just, sorry, just touch on maybe the medical system 
the fact yeah. that this is not covered by health yeah, insurance, it's not covered which by is, insurance. And that's why you've done the documentary. So we're going to transition over to that. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Okay. So the symptoms are different for every person. That's why this is so challenging. However, there are some hallmark, hallmark symptoms. So if you have the flu in the summer, in the height of tick season, right? Fevers, mm. chills, headaches. That's something to consider. You know, the flu season usually isn't in May or June or July. Mm. So that's something to keep an eye out for. But also, you know, migratory joint pain, joint pain that moves around your body from, you know, your elbow to your knee. You can mm. actually feel it kind of, you know, it's moving. It's moving. so bizarre tingling, numbness, you know, neurological symptoms, aching hands. My hands and my arms used to ache. Mm-hmm. It kind of progresses from like, you know, this is an overgeneralization, of course, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it, it sort of progresses from flu-like symptoms to arthritic symptoms to neurologic mm-hmm. symptoms. That's a very good description. And so it moves through these different stages and as it moves into your nervous system, that would suggest that it's in the later stage. You want to catch it Within, you want to catch it immediately, but what's exactly. challenging is that there's no de- currently available diagnostic test to detect it oh, immediately. No. And the test also has a hard time detecting it later on because it's an antibody test. And so maybe your body hasn't generated enough antibodies, or maybe the Lyme disease bacteria has been in your system for so long that it's actually suppressing your mm. antibody production and then you're not going to light up, you know, the test as a positive. So, the test is a big part of this, this picture. There is a test that is more sensitive. It's called the IGENEX test, mm-hmm. I-G-E-N-E-X test. But most medical professionals will not recognize it as a legitimate test and it's not covered by insurance. And it's very expensive. It's very expensive. I had to live at home with my mom and sleep on her couch for two years to afford not just the testing, but the initial doctor's appointments. And I mean, these doctors spend hours with you because it's Mm -hmm. complicated. And that's part of why the insurance companies are denying this Mm. because they can only, they not can, they have chosen to only cover (laughs) appointments that are, you know, 15, 20 minutes at most. How do you, how do you tackle a complex illness or a host of complex illnesses in 15 to 20 minutes? It's not possible, Mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's the really unfortunate aspect of this, of this disease. And, and that's, that's part of what, you know, prompted the, the making of the quiet epidemic was watching Lyme disease bankrupt my own mother and watching it bankrupt so many people around me. People are losing their homes. People are living in their cars mm-hmm. and no one knows if this happens until it happens to them because exactly. we're not hearing about it from our health, our health agencies. And that's unacceptable. No, it's unacceptable. So those are the symptoms. That's the the kind of insurance debacle so just side with, of this. Sorry, with the symptoms though. So it's the fe- it's fe- fe- sorry the fevers in non flu season. Yeah, high tick season. That's I mean, one it of can the, also start in flu season, but that's an, flu especi- season. that's an especially you know that's that I think is it's more obvious. I should say if it's not during flu season. Okay, and then it's the and then it's the joint pain, but it seems to be moving. I yeah, remember my, yeah. my, my hands being sore. I remember as a child doing this with my hands and, and my daughter doing this and having, having to massage. But as it, as it travels through the body yeah. and then also the neurological symptoms where that's where the fogginess, brain fogginess, concentration, tiredness, yeah, lethargy, yeah. psychiatric symptoms, yeah, not being able to get out of OCD, bed. OCD, OCD, symptoms, depression, a lot of depression, anxiety, big time. Schizophrenia, yeah. Yeah. all of it. I mean, Imagine All those scary the, descriptions. Very, very scary. And, you know, someone who's really, really worth looking into, and he would actually be an excellent guest <laughs> on this podcast, okay. is Dr. Brian Fallon at Columbia University. Okay. I will His follow specialty up. is, he's the head of the, he's the director of the Tick-Borne Disease uh, Research Center mm-hmm. there at Columbia. But his his personal specialty is Lyme and its impact on mental health. Okay. So he published an article in 2021 in the American Journal of Psychiatry that showed that people with Lyme were, I think, around 28% more likely to develop mental disorders than people without Lyme. And Mm. they were twice as likely to attempt committing suicide. Oh, gosh. Than healthy people. Okay. So So this this is is, serious. This this is is a really huge burden. Yeah. 
it's so serious. The fact that doctors are not able to really properly screen for this screen because the test doesn't work and that it's just not in there. It's just, you know, the medical, the medical school education, System. the mm-hmm. curriculum is so far behind on this. I have friends who are doctors who have seen what I've gone through and they've watched the quiet epidemic and, and they reflect on what their medical school education was on Lyme disease. And maybe it was a couple paragraphs. Look for the bullseye rash and r- run the ELISA and the Western blot, which like isn't accurate. Okay. That's, that's about help. it. That's about well, it. But like the that same said, thing. looking, checking for a bullseye rash is still valuable. And although, you know, it's, it's not super common, it still is a symptom. And I think the most important thing that people can do is to be tick aware and to do tick checks. Because if you mm-hmm. see a tick on you, or your child or your pet, and then you notice that they start to act funny, Mm -hmm. that's data. And to get even more data, what you can do is save the tick and then send it away to be tested. There's a website called tickreport.com. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's a lab. I think it's UMass Amherst, and they test for Lyme and other pathogens. So that's good to know as well. That's fantastic. That's really Mm -hmm. good advice. Okay. So there's, it's to, so we've identified symptoms or as far as possible. Yeah. And then you can, that, that's great news to know that if you identify the tick, you can send it away. We'll put that yeah. link. If you could send us that, we'll put yeah, that in the show notes. Definitely. Then in terms of, I know there's the, the Lyme Disease Society or Association and there's a whole lot of body of doctors that are involved with that. Did you, because um, there, there you can find maybe a doctor in your own region or do you have a link or somewhere that people can find doctors that are literate? Lyme, <laughs> yes. Who I'm would have thought part of that the, that was a whole world, no, right? No, it is. Because we actually connected with the as head of the association, Lyme Disease Association. So I'll put that in this link too. But I'm interested to see if you, how did you find your your network of doctors? I found my doctor because of my mom. And this is what's wild. People say it and it's true that Lyme is a word of mouth diagnosis because most people who get diagnosed don't hear about it from their doctor. Most doctors don't really want to get involved. It's it's controversial. The quiet epidemic explains why that is, yeah, how it came to be that way. But there's been a lot of debating over the nature of the illness. And this is why the work that we're doing now with the quiet epidemic and, you know, we're we're launching a global movement. Which to, is fantastic. Yeah, to demand the full recognition of the spectrum of manifestations mm-hmm. of Lyme disease, not just the acute stage, but the full range of what it means to have Lyme disease tick-borne illness and really demand that we have accurate diagnostics and effective therapies immediately. Mm -hmm. Not someday. No. This should have happened decades ago and we have a lot of catching up to do. So we're actually going to Congress in a couple of weeks. Fantastic. I saw that. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's a really, it's really an important thing because There's just so much suffering. People are, yes, killing themselves. They're declaring bankruptcy and children are losing their childhoods. And we should and could have the tools to figure this out if the research funding was prioritized on par with the scale of suffering. Exactly, exactly. If you take some of the money that's being spent on, very, very misspent on the psychiatric field, uh, chasing after theories that have been disproved for such a long time and channeled those billions into part of those, some of those billions into is it Lyme disease research, we would see a massive reduction in psychiatric problems. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. that's, yeah, it needs to be. So it's, 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 I'm sure you're going to talk about that when you, when you go to Congress as oh, well. Which 100%. Is, yeah. Mm-hmm. The amount of money that's being wasted, mm-hmm. healthcare dollars that are being wasted by not looking at the root cause. It's tough though, because pharmaceutical companies are making money off of the lifelong management exactly, and suppressing of symptoms. So it's like we're in a pickle here because the insurance companies, you know, they don't want to pay for long-term treatment Mm -hmm. for Lyme disease. And yet those patients who don't receive the treatment go on to have much more severe illnesses, which cost cost way more, right? But then pharmaceutical companies are profiting off of people not getting diagnosed and treated early. So it's it's kind of a mess, but really we just have to reckon with the fact that we're living in a for-profit healthcare system. And, mm. and that's the other part of this conversation that mm-hmm. we're igniting with the quiet epidemic is, you know, yes, the film is about Lyme disease. Our campaign is focused on Lyme disease, but Lyme disease is the canary in the coal mine. <laughs> yeah. There is so much more that is going on that is so wrong and, and so unnecessary. And, and people, 
want to be well. And we need people to be well because mm. our society is not going to be able to function no. if future generations are being debilitated by tick bites. And Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's just so many things there. Well, Lindsay, this is amazing. I, I don't want to bypass on the treatment side. So yeah, be, yeah. And I want to come back to the, this, with this discussion about the healthcare system, but let's, let's, if you don't mind, let's just transition back to the treatment side, because that's really, I'm very interested to hear what your treatment protocol was and you know, what <laughs> yeah. the options are for people. Yeah. Well, I should first start by saying that every person is different and yeah, I don't know, individuality. I don't know any two Lyme patients who have had the same treatment. So people ask me this question all the time and mm -hmm. I'm actually pretty reluctant to respond because some of them want to go follow beat by beat what okay. Lindsay did to get better. And that's okay. not how this works. So it's important to just share that up front. But what I Very did, good. and the, some of these things sound completely bizarre and I never imagined that I would do any of this, but when your life depends on it and the mainstream doesn't have any tools to offer you, you'll try literally anything. Oh yeah, of <laughs> right? course. Right? And so for me, you know, the first step of course was antibiotics. Mm -hmm. That was the most obvious place to start antibiotics were very intense. It was a, mm. it was a collection of them. It wasn't just one. It was different antibiotics to treat the illness and the bacteria in its mm. various stages, right? Because some of them, some of the bacteria go into what are called biofilms where they're able to hide and kind of cloak themselves mm -hmm. from antibiotics. And they develop persisters where, you know, you treat the bacteria, but there's a root that's still there. And when the antibiotic is removed, the root grows back. And that's mm. why it has sort of this relapsing, remitting rhythm to it. So I was on a host of antibiotics, rotating them, pulsing them. That was really intense. And, and the treatment often makes you feel worse. Mm. So you don't even know if it's helping or not, but you just have to go for it and just oh, try. Yeah. So the doctor would say, how are you feeling today? And I'm like, what? Terrible. I feel awful. I feel like I feel way worse. Like this yeah. cannot be helping, but it did. It did help. So I stuck with it. And I did that for almost a year. And then I actually made the call. I was like, you know what? I think I'm done with antibiotics. And I give my doctor credit. That's what's cool about, you know, a lot of these doctors who are in the trenches with chronically ill patients. It's more of a collaboration. They listen mm, to the patients. That's so good. So yeah, important. It is. It is. And so you actually feel like you have some agency and that's good because you need to feel empowered to get your health back, right? Mm -hmm. So you're a collaborator. So then I kind of just went off on my own. I then did a year of an herbal protocol called, called the Cowden protocol. Mm -hmm. And it was all of these tinctures. And I was that person with my little box of tinctures. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You know, excuse me for a moment. And, you know, just had it like on the hoods of cars or this is all while filming the quiet epidemic. So it yeah, was a really of... a wild process of trying to stay well and, and actively treat while traveling and filming. So How did much. you, so sure that must have been so hard. So you said that it was more of a, like a net. What did you call that? Sorry, that treat, uh, that treatment protocol after the antibiotics, the tinctures. It's like a it's more called natural. The, yeah, it's an herbal protocol. Yeah, and it's, yeah herbal. Yeah, that's it's a my specific, the specific protocol I did is called the Cowden protocol, mm -hmm. C-O-W-D-E-N, Cowden. Yeah. And it was developed by a doctor. His last name is Cowden. And, and he has experience treating patients with Lyme and tick-borne illness. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that that made a difference. And yeah. then I completed that. But, you know, I still wasn't, I still wasn't myself and I still wasn't mm -hmm. better. And so then at that point, this is where things get even more bizarre. Mm -hmm. I had heard about bee venom therapy. I had heard about people with Lyme disease and multiple sclerosis and other illnesses doing a type of therapy that involves stinging yourself with live bees. I've, wow, I've heard about this. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard some miraculous stories of people who were fully bedridden, completely disabled, totally out of taken out of society, getting their health back through bee venom. And there wow, is some research amazing. starting to be done mm -hmm. on that. And I did that for a year and a half and that helped. Did that and help? Okay. Yeah. That <laughs> wow. And then I, you know, along the way there are like, there's lower hanging fruit, like avoiding refined sugar, gluten, dairy. I cleaned up my diet. I stopped drinking alcohol. Yeah, I was, that's a big one, isn't it? The alcohol. Oh, it's huge. huge. Can you speak for a moment about that? Alcohol. Actually, you know what? One of the doctors in our film, he says that a, a sign to look out for of maybe having Lyme disease is if suddenly your hangovers get really bad. And, and 
And it's actually true. Like my body had a, suddenly had a, it had an increasingly difficult time processing Mm. alcohol. And so if I, if I just had to totally cut it out, it wasn't worth it anymore. I felt awful. And Mm. so, yeah, that's low hanging fruit. If you don't feel well, take care of what you can, you know, Mm. it's, it's, it's there, it's a choice. And I just did it cold turkey because again, I was like thinking I'm going to die and I wanted so badly to live. So I did everything that I possibly could. Yoga saved me. I did yoga every mm. morning, even though I was in so much pain. I, my joints, my body hurt mm-hmm. so but it badly. So much, yeah. It did. I was as strong as I'd ever been. Mm. Like I, I was, I was very strong, and and it didn't make any sense because my body was falling apart, but my muscles were were there, and that helped me get through. I think. Well, there's so much that happens with with yoga, as we know, in terms of you know that what it, it, it moved from the word yoga, just the fact that you're moving your body in that way and it's stimulating the bone, it's right down to the marrow of the bones and the blood flow and the oxygen. And these are all things that can help to increase immune f- defenses and so on. And yeah, so that's, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you there, but yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, glad no, you mentioned I love that. hearing what you say. Yeah. Yeah. Yoga was huge. And I mean, what, you know, what actually really saved me when I was totally spiraling, when I was having the compulsive suicidal thoughts and mm-hmm. I would journal every night Oh, that's because amazing. I was actually losing my grip on who I was. I was forgetting oh, who I was. I was forgetting. I couldn't get home from work. I was forgetting everything. I couldn't remember my phone number. I couldn't no. even, it was almost like I, I was drifting away from you. my reality. Yeah. And it's so Disassociating hard to, a little bit yeah. as well. Oh, I mean, yeah. full blown, like that's derealization. Big, yeah. Yeah. That's a big blown symptom. Oh, it was so terrifying. Scary. And so, so the I would journaling write, grounded I journaling. you. Yeah, ground and I'm, you. it's funny. I'm actually now running a like a virtual writing group called Pressure Release. Oh, I love where that. Where I hold space for people who, you know, are just, you know, going through life and, and maybe would benefit from like having a virtual community and just people there to write alongside. Oh, it saved beautiful. my life. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I really did. And it, and it wasn't about writing anything to be published or writing anything mm-hmm. that would it's be great. just to get that. Yeah. To, to anchor you back and to help with that derealization, the disassociation, yes. the finding who you were, the reminding of your narrative, the like yes. pulling together of your soul kind of exactly. thing. Exactly. I was writing yeah. simple things like, my name is Lindsay Keys. Mm. I was born in 1989. Like simple wow. things. It was whatever I could. Like you said, anchor is the perfect word. Mm-hmm. I, I was just trying so hard to hold on to this little tether. Shame. You know, this little tether. So yeah, all of all of these tools have been so important. Infrared sauna for mm. detoxing. Oh, every day I have a sauna here. My daughter's going at yeah. It's, yeah, that's huge. Mm-hmm. And you know what's sad is that a lot of people who are chronically ill, and I'm sure you've experienced mm-hmm. this, people look at you like you're kind of weird or they'll even mock you or make fun of you for trying these wacky things. And it's like, listen, if if the research had been prioritized, for the past 50 years since Lyme had been discovered and we had a sweet little pill that you could take <laughs> yeah. and it would cure me. Sign me up. I would have loved that. Exactly, exactly. But it doesn't work like that. And even you know, if we have, as you say, if, even with the research, but that it would have made, it's because it's such a complex disease as all diseases are. And we don't really understand, you know, the full biochemistry, although we know so much more about the brain and the body. So the research is needed to explain why these combinations of protocols work. You know, yes. I've been fortunate, as I said, that I didn't have lingering symptoms, but my youngest daughter, my son, and my, both my nephews, they have really battled, especially the one nephew. It's been like 10, sort of six, seven years of his life that has been affected. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, everyone that tells me they've had Lyme disease or anything, I always say, so get, get into that infrared sauna. It makes a yes. massive difference. The bee venom, I mean, I'm, Thrilled to hear you talk about that. Not that I've <laughs> tried that, but I know people who have. But beeswax, I swear by that stuff. You know, and it's not bee venom, but it's beeswax. There's some, something inside the bee, beeswax for healing things. It's like insane. And yeah. so there's, you know, it's, and, and you don't want to just try. We're not, we're not advocating here. Lindsay and I are not advocating a hodgepodge, whatever. But it's, you know, there's, there's, with something, there are certain things that, that infrared saunas have had research. Bee venom has had right. research. Yeah. And exactly. eventually all of it does come together. Mm-hmm. Um, and what you, what you're saying is that you're not saying that there's one protocol. You're talking about bio individuality. And exactly. the fact is that, you know, if you, we're in a day and an age where 
the more knowledge we have as an individual that we can go to the doctors with and say, these are my symptoms. This is what I'd like to try. Can you help me put this together? You know, doctors, a lot of doctors are very open to that because yes. they don't have time to research every single thing about every single thing. But if you can go, hey, I found this paper on bee venom and how this helps with potentially this protocol helps with because that herbal protocol, my daughter didn't do that one, she did another, another one, but it, it helped to a certain extent. But all the things, as you said, eventually all add up and yeah. get you to a place. But the thing with Lyme disease that is always quite, and I don't know if you've experienced this with your mom and yourself, is that it'll go through these, and you said it already, the periods where it's, re, where it's there you go in remission. And yeah. then something, and you think, ah, oh, this is under control. And then suddenly something happens or you're exposed to something in oh, the yeah. environment. And that just throws you back to like square one again. Yeah. Has that happened? Has that happened to you? Yeah, that actually just recently happened to me and mm, I so haven't even really been talking about this much. This is like my first time publicly sharing this and, and I'm okay, but I got COVID again. Oh, I'm sorry. For I think the fifth or sixth time at oh, this gosh. point. And again, I'm immunocompromised because of Lyme disease, right? So my immune system isn't as strong as, as others. And so I, yeah, I, I don't feel like I'm back at square one by any means. That's great. But I don't feel great right now. Mm. Like I was, if you had asked me a couple of months ago, how I was feeling, I'd be like, I'm cured. I'm amazing. Everything's great. And right now I'm sort of like, like I need to figure Mm. out how to, how to clear this fog that I'm in. I'm like in a total fog. I'm so sorry. And I think that the research that's being done, for example, at Mount Sinai by Dr. David Petrino, he's an amazing researcher Mm -hmm. at Mount Sinai. He is looking at the infectious root of chronic illnesses, chronic Lyme being one of them, Mm. long COVID, Mm. multiple sclerosis, myalgic encephalomyelitis, CFS, Mm. and Ehlers-Danos syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's a curious thing that a lot of people with chronic Lyme and long COVID have very similar symptoms. And I think the research funding for both of those illnesses should absolutely be cross-pollinating and and helping figure out what's going on, you know, and chronic Lyme has been neglected for decades and now all of this money is being poured into long COVID. So I'm really hoping that some of that research will trickle over into helping us out on the chronic uh, chronic Lyme side, or maybe there's not even a side, maybe it's like a similar a, a, a two parts of the same, mm-hmm. two parts of the same protocol, perhaps. Or Absolutely, we brought in it's one research study looking at two different elements, sort of thing. Totally. Yeah. And the one more thing that I really want to mention, mm. as far as like the the treatment side of things, which is a kind of sensitive topic, but I think it's really important. Mm-hmm. So. In the Lyme disease community, a lot of people are told that they're faking it, that they're imagining oh. their illness. It's awful, right? And really, it's just that we don't have a test that works. <laughs> yeah. And kids so they are can't being put told, their finger on it, but it's... Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You just must be imagining it. Or yeah, as Julia, the main subject of our film, she was told that she was faking it. And we include the audio, audio footage of audio recording of her as an 11-year-old child pleading with the doctor to just help her figure it out because she wasn't it's faking terrible. it. And, so there, but there is a mental aspect to having Lyme disease, mm. mental illness, everything else. And it's not that you're faking it, but it's that it's a very traumatic experience to go through a chronic illness mm. emotionally and physically, right? Mm. So the, the nervous system dysregulation is a huge piece of this. And that would make sense as far as the emotional triggers triggering a physical reaction, right? So absolutely, your nervous system goes haywire. Mm-hmm. What follows? Your immune system goes mm-hmm. haywire. Mm-hmm. And then the symptoms start to show up or the illness manifests for the first time. And something that I've been spending time with and a lot of people in the chronic Lyme community and chronic illness community have been spending mm-hmm. time doing is neural retraining programs. Mm. So there are programs like Primal Trust or DNRS or Mm -hmm. Reorigin. These are all different programs where you're actually spending time retraining your brain and trying to really balance and heal your nervous system. And as you heal your nervous system, hopefully the immune system follows suit. Well, it definitely, well, I can tell you now from, thank you for sharing that. I'm so excited. I didn't mean to 
it's she jumped so quickly that I got so excited because I am a psycho neurobiologist. We publish and do research on the whole mind body connection, and I have the system called the NeuroCycle, which is basically it's based on the neuro the the neuroplasticity research I did forty years ago. Some of the first mm-hmm. in the field, and oh it's my goodness, how you amazing. rewire the psycho neurobiological network, and it's basically your mind. Your mind is driving everything that's going on in your body. Yes. So your immune system responds immediately to your mind. So as we have to deal with the virus, obviously, and the pathogens and all the sure, impact and everything. Exactly. But your mind is what's making the efficiency of all of that work more efficient work because your mind drives your mental functioning as well as your neurophysiological functioning. Exactly. So although um, people on this podcast hear me talk a lot about all the time about how we can learn to manage our mind and the neurocycles, the system, how information, how life gets into us. Built in a network and drives us, and right. that and your immune system and your brain and your body do not distinguish between a pathogen like a tick bite fever or like you know the, the pathogens from that can come from a tick and, and a psychological trauma and the psychological trauma that is part of the chronic illness. So it's all intertwined. So your immune system is responding to everything, and if your immune system is constantly in hyperactive mode, it's hyperimmune. Your you know you there's a direct if, if by using our mind you are not. You, you are you are calming down the entire system of the body. You re, you rewiring networks, activating resilience, and improving immune function. So it's not just some pie in the sky maybe link. It is an actual link. Yeah, and it should be like the I would maybe I'm biased, but I would say it would be the first line of any treatment for anyone with any kind of chronic illness is to get your mind stronger and he- healing and because your mind is putting energy into the brain and the body. Without your mind, you're dead. So if your mind That's is right. getting healed your mind automatically is healing the networks of the brain and the body, increasing resistance and helping to fight the pathogen. I'm not saying the neurocycle is going to eliminate Lyme disease. I am not saying that. I haven't done any research in that line. What I'm saying is that I do know that if you use the neurocycle, which is basically training the, retraining the networks of your mind, brain, body network, you are going to increase and activate the natural resilience inside of you, improve cell health, improve DNA health, improve every every second of the day you're making 800,000 to a million new cells and the quality of those determine the quality of your entire body and the strength of your immune system to fight pathogens. So by using the neurocycle, you're influencing that. So you're going to the core and you're driving it in the right direction. So I would say it's a really huge part. So I'm really glad you mentioned about the, the mind aspect and that needs to be a massive part because as you've said so clearly, I'm so glad you've mentioned this, you know, the suicide, the psychiatric symptoms. I'm glad that towards the end of this podcast you have this interview you've brought up the mental side uh, the mental aspect as well because it's massive as you know when your mind is is all over the place and you want to you feel suicidal every minute of the day and you're depressed and you can't get out it's awful you don't want to live and if there's hope which is what you're providing yes yes. you know this is really great so in in our in our wrap-up minutes over here would you mind just telling us about your fantastic documentary the silent silent epidemic where people can get hold of it where they can watch it, what, what they can do to support you. you can yeah, yeah, tell that's us. great. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that, by the way. That's so cool. That, that's like a big part of your world. And I am so excited to share your program with the Lyme community because they're always looking for something to try. And, oh, and that's well, really I'll send encouraging. You, I'll send you a link to the NeuroCycle. We'll put you, set you up on the NeuroCycle. Okay, you can try amazing. It out. Oh, that would be amazing. So yeah, The Quiet Epidemic is available on Amazon Prime Video, Apple TV, iTunes, and Vimeo On Demand. And I mean, seven years of your life. It's been seven years making making the film and then touring it. Mm. And the film is powerful because yes, it's in part investigative. We get into the insurance side of Mm -hmm. things. We get into, you know, pharmaceutical industry conflicts of interests and certain powers that be that have, you know, seemingly obstructed the evolution of science. And that's that's important knowledge. It's so important. And and again, there's no way that this is only happening in Lyme disease, right? No, it's happening across the board. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Which, you know, and, but there are also very human stories that are interwoven Mm. with the, the research and the evidence that we lay out. And our main subjects are really amazing people. And I think that they are beacons of hope for any person, whether they have Lyme or mental illness, or even if they're perfectly healthy, but they're just going through the hard things that happen in life. Mm -hmm. So it's really a story about people who are not giving up. And it's a story about people who 
having gone through a really hard time, find meaning and purpose in helping others. Mm. And I think that that is what helped me get better. It's amazing. Right? And it's certainly what I've seen help the people in our film and the people in the Lyme community and just the people in my life. Having a purpose is everything. The way that the film started, here we go. We'll we'll end with the very beginning, right? Okay, I love that. I love it. My very first appointment, now that everyone's heard what a hot mess I was, I was... We all have messes, by the way. I was I was a real mess, right? Mm -hmm. Barely barely alive physically Shame. mentally emotionally financially completely drained my only Shame. parent declaring bankruptcy from Lyme oh. I was like what do I do what do I do so I go into this Lyme specialist office my first appointment and the nurse she was amazing she said how are you going to get through this do you have a passion oh my goodness and she said we find that patients at our clinic who have a purpose, tend to have better outcomes. And of course, there's no science backing that up, right? There but is. that's what they there see. Oh, is there? Is. There is. Is there? Oh there my God, I want to see that. Up. That's going to help my case. Yeah. You, you yeah. just helped me out. <laughs> because people yes. are like, oh, really? Where's the proof of that? And I'm like, you know what? That's what sometimes anecdotal evidence is just as valuable. And that should be what's driving the research, right? So what she was seeing in their clinic was the people who had a will to live. They had a purpose and a passion. They tended to, to heal. Mm -hmm. And so I told her in that moment, I'm, I'm going to make a documentary about Lyme. I had no idea how I was going to do it or who I was going to do it with, but she looked really excited. And she said, we have another patient here who's your age and he's a filmmaker also with Lyme disease. Do you want me to connect the two of you? Oh, that's right. That's your And that's that, my co-director. That's your, oh my gosh, that's so your story. So having a passion, beautiful. having a passion saved my life. Wow. It led to the creation of the film. And I think that that's just, that's maybe my most hopeful message is that if you can find a passion, if you can find a purpose, a will to live, something to that gets you really excited and offers meaning for your life, then miracles can happen. Oh, that's so beautiful. I mean, I can't even say any more. You said it all. That's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for sharing your story. I am really am so honored and to have heard it. And I support you 100% in your journey to taking this to Congress and, you know, fighting for people that have battled so much with something that they shouldn't have to, it's hard enough anyway, but to have a system that's yeah. fighting against you on exactly. top of it. You want yeah. the system on your side. So if you can make a difference, in, and I know you're going to make a difference in so many people's lives with your you. with your movie and people need to get their hands on it. We'll put all the links in the show notes. Is is, is there anywhere else people can get hold of you, follow you, support yeah. you? Yeah, so watching the film is one way to get involved. But then, of course, following us on social media, The Quiet Epidemic. We're most active on Instagram, but we do have a Facebook page and we have a newsletter sign up through our website, thequietepidemic.com. And people are also hosting screenings of the film to bring their communities together and with Wonderful. panel discussions to offer their communities resources and community, you know, that is uh, resourced and Lyme literate in case they need it. So that's another way to get involved. But I'm, I'm there online. Our team, our little engine that could team is working hard behind the scenes and yeah, we'll see where it goes. Oh, that's amazing. Well, thank you for what you're doing. You know, just brought it to mind. I did a conference about 18 months ago and. One of the other speakers at the conference was a mom who'd lost her child to suicide from Lyme disease. And oh. I had this, you know, your story just as you were talking, oh it just came back in my mind and how she just also didn't know what to do and didn't have the support and, and her daughter couldn't take it. And she did go through, oh. you know, and that's heartbreaking. So, you know, yes. your story, what you're speaking about and what you're doing could save someone's life. So, yeah, I you hope know, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And who ever know if anyone listening to this now knows of anyone who could, or if you have the symptoms, whatever, reach out, find out more. Yes. And the more we stand together from a, on a grassroots level, the more one can make a change. So absolutely. The, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Thank <laughs> you. Till next time, everyone.